Hello, I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Uh, I'm the, also the safety officer, so before we begin, when we have public events, we start with a little bit of a public safety announcement. So I'm the responsible safety officer for, for today, so if anything happens, please follow my instructions. Uh, the exits are right in front of us. Uh, the emergency escape is down right on that corner. We'll go outside and meet across the street in that really nice park under the cherry blossoms. So please follow me if we have to do something. So thank you. So uh, we're here to talk about China's uh, Belt and Road Initiatives and implications for global infrastructure. We're also rolling out two papers. Uh, the work has been sponsored by the GE Foundation, so I want to thank the GE Foundation. Uh, but I also want to particularly thank my friend Jim Dunton, who is in the CSIS Publications Department. He moved heaven and earth. Uh, to put these uh, two publications together on very short uh, notice, and so he is one of the heroes of, of today's event, and we're particularly grateful to Jim Dunton. I, I want to thank several other people. I want to thank uh, my colleague Charles Rice and Nikki White, my two colleagues in the back, who I think have really quarterbacked this, so thank you both, Nikki, thank you, Charles. I want to thank my colleague uh, Connor Savoy. I think we have a very, very interesting panel uh, today, and I, uh, I think we're going to you think you all have their biographies, but I think it's suffice to say, I think we have a very uh, thoughtful group of people uh, to talk about these issues. And I think there's several questions we want to understand, which is we want to understand the phenomenon of one belt and one road, and uh, both as a domestic and a development phenomenon, but also how should the United States and other partners in the OECD think about this? And how should we think about this from a development standpoint? And how should we think about this um, in the context of the multilateral system. Uh, I think my, I'll make a couple of editorial comments and just say that it's a, uh, I think that uh, for certainly the emergence of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank should be perceived as a salutary wake-up call. And I use that term specifically, a salutary wake-up call uh, for the World Bank Group, other multilateral development uh, institutions uh, founded by the United States and its partners, as well as I think a salutary wake-up call for the United States as a country to reprioritize infrastructure, but also to think about the sorts of inst instruments that we have. And we have many instruments, uh, but also to think about how we both prioritize infrastructure, but also how it fits within a larger strategy and our, our theory of change, if you will, of international development. Um, so let me, um, let me just briefly mention who is with us. I know John Hurley is going to be joining us from the US Treasury. I'm sure he is working very hard as we speak um, at the Treasury Department, so your tax dollars are at work. So thank you, John, for that. Uh, so he'll be joining us, I'm sure, shortly. Uh, but I want to first uh, introduce my colleague, uh, Chris Johnson, who's a senior advisor and Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS, who's the author of President uh, Xi Jinping's uh, Belt and Road Initiative report, which is one of the two that we're rolling out. Uh, then we're also going to hear from uh, Mr. Uh, Ziad Haider, who is the Special Representative for Commercial and Business Affairs, the Bureau of Economics and Business Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, then we're going to hear from my friend Olin Wethington, who's the Founder and Chairman of Wethington International. Uh, Olin was also Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for International Affairs in President Bush 41. Uh, and he was also, he's also um, co-chaired a very important uh, bipartisan review of the Asian economic architecture that I hope he'll speak about as well. Um, and then you're, we're also going to hear from my friend John Hurley, who's the Director for International Debt and Development Policy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to my friend and colleague, Chris Johnson. Chris, over to you. Great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and thank you all for coming today. And uh, let me just add my thanks to the uh, folks who helped us uh, sponsor the study, the GE Foundation, uh, and to the panelists for, uh, for joining us today. Um, I, I've been given the unenviable task of trying to condense this paper into five to seven minutes, as, <laughs> as we always do here. So I'm just going to hit a couple of the key themes that we came across in the research and give a little sense of uh, the cut we were trying to take, if you will, on Belt and Road. Uh, there's a, a sea of material that's uh, been written on this subject. Um, and will continue, I think, to be written on the subject. And so our effort was to sort of think about how we might make something of a unique contribution to that, uh, and then explain sort of our key conclusions and give you a little sense of how we think this applies to policy as we always 
try to do here at CSIS. Um, fundamentally, the, the task that was put before us uh, was to sort of, uh, and I like the way we combined these two subjects. Um, one was to look at uh, Belt and Road and to sort of come up with, you know, where do we think this came from? That really was our emphasis in the report, the foundations of it. There's plenty of work, as I mentioned, that's been done about the different, the belt and the road and the challenges that we'll face and the complicated environment um, that uh, from security, political, you know, all sorts of different angles that the Chinese will face with this. But our effort was focused on trying to give a sense of where this came from. It didn't just arrive, uh, sort of fully sprung, if you will, <laughs> at one point. Um, and then to give a sense of how important it is within the Chinese system, because I think that's something that's underappreciated uh, here in the West. So um, where, did it, where did it come from? I mean, I think two major takeaways for us uh, from the study. The first is that you know, the initiative itself is, despite its many potential flaws, comprehensive very focused, and I think really most importantly, very personal to President Xi. And that is uh, very important in the context of the increasingly sort of personalized leadership and sort of foreign policy system that we've seen President Xi Jinping create for himself since coming to power in 2012. And then I think the second sort of overarching theme that we came across was that the OBOR initiative is more about economics than the geostrategic um, elements, which are often touted in writings that have been done on it. And arguably, uh, it may be more about domestic politics uh, than it is about the economics. So that's sort of the way we've uh, come through on the hierarchy. Uh, my own view is that the, the latter point about the domestic politics, it's more a risk that the domestic politics and its close association with President Xi could in fact trump the economics in some ways that make uh, the situation very difficult and complicated for Beijing. So to drill down a little bit on a couple of those concepts. I think it's very important for us to look at, and we've spent a lot of time on this in the study, the connection between the evolution in Chinese foreign policy that we've seen since Xi Jinping arrived and the sort of foundations of the Belt and Road Initiative. And I think that we see uh, very clearly this initiative kind of springing, if you will, from the developments in China's foreign policy canon uh, since Xi Jinping arrived. Uh, and it really comes down to a major speech that he made uh, in the fall of 2014, where he held this so-called uh, foreign affairs work conference. These are very rare uh, inside the system. Usually the top leader may have one of these during his tenure or at most two. Um, and it really gives the sitting leader the opportunity opportunity to lay out his foreign policy vision. And in there, what we saw Xi Jinping do was to, of course, endorse the previous elements of the foreign policy canon that have existed well before he arrived on the scene. This has to do primarily with China's emphasis on peaceful development, or that its approach to its neighbors and to the world globally is to provide win-win solutions, and that there's nothing to worry about, basically, with China's growth and uh, growing international influence. And the second is what they call, in their internal jargon, the period of strategic opportunity, uh, which sounds sort of horrible and clunky, but when you boil it down, what it means is that China assesses that the external environment that it confronts remains sufficiently benign in nature that they can focus on their internal development. Um, that really is the, uh, uh, the sort of key uh, crux there. And it has several important implications. One, it tells us that the Chinese are very focused internally, and therefore, as such, um, what they will do externally has some hard limits on it uh, with regard to uh, particularly will they be sort of a disruptive power in East Asia and, and globally. Um, second, I think the other major tenet of this is the notion that historically what this has meant when they've talked about the period of strategic opportunity is that China has been a tremendous beneficiary of uh, sort of a series of external circumstances that have served their great benefit, but that they were sort of taking advantage of a gift from uh, the outside that has helped them develop. Um, what was interesting to us in looking at the study is the way in which Xi Jinping takes those concepts and then sort of redefines them uh, a little bit in his own uh, sort of framing. And I think the first way he does that, uh, peaceful development remains pretty much the same. The period of strategic opportunity in the foreign policy speech was bent uh, a little bit in terms of how he thinks about why there's a period of strategic opportunity. To look at it less as sort of a beneficent gift that was handed to uh, China and its development path from the outside to China as the engine 
and sustainer of that period of strategic opportunity. And that really is a fundamental shift in the way they think about that problem. And what that leads to, we think, is uh, a sense that uh, increasingly we will see this more sort of proactive, some will say assertive, uh, effort by China, both in the region and globally. And that obviously fits very much with the Belt and Road uh, concept in terms of the providing the undergirding uh, for that. The second piece, uh, just to highlight, is uh, the sort of internal structure on how Belt and Road is, is being managed inside the system. They have the kind of traditional high-level leading group uh, that, that they put together when they have these sort of initiatives. But what struck us in our research about the leading group that's been put together is uh, these are very sort of serious Politburo members in Xi Jinping's universe. Uh, and so that's an important factor that we think uh, really matters. Um, and you've got all the right portfolios associated with this, not just the nuts and bolts parts of what would need to be done in order to make the Belt and Road Initiative take off, but also the foreign policy uh, sort of angle with uh, State Councilor Yang Jiechi's presence to manage sort of the inevitable uh, bumping up, if you will, against Russia, against others, you know, in the in the region as they pursue this initiative, and then also interestingly, sort of the party's main theoretician Wang Huning to kind of give the thing some ideological uh, legs, and again, looking at that close connection between the party's sort of foreign policy canon and doctrine and ideology and the practical pieces of OBOR. Um, and so, uh, you know, we see that there's a, a firm mechanism put together and it, it really makes a difference because, you know, in looking at the research, one of the main reasons why they decided to do this is to finally provide a co more coherent strategy to what they've struggled with for decades now, which is how do we develop our least developed provinces in the Northeast, in the West of China, Southwest of China, um, uh, southeast, rather, excuse me, southwest of China. Uh, and they've had a lot of difficulty doing this. The, this is seen as the solution, you know, providing an overarching framework to actually make that uh, more meaningful. And we see that, uh, indeed, all these provinces are reacting to the Belt and Road Initiative. Obviously, the risk is that they take a bunch of projects that they couldn't get funded otherwise, rebrand them as Belt and Road, uh, and then, you know, suck away central resources, and that's certainly a problem that we see uh, them facing. Uh, similarly, I think, you know, really, uh, and again, this is the economics trumping the geo strategy, uh, OBOR is seen as offering an opportunity to help absorb China's massive excess industrial capacity uh, that the increasingly over-leveraged Chinese economy simply can no longer sustain on its own. And likewise, these projects uh, can provide a lifeline to large state firms who are overburdened with debt uh, by allowing them to gain access to fresh capital from state banks that might otherwise have to deal with a large wave of non-performing loans uh, that could precipitate some sort of financial crisis. So we see that the uh, one of the sort of uh, primary movers of Belt and Road, but also I think one of its chief risks, is that it's seen as the solution to a lot of different problems, maybe too many. And as we point out in the piece, it's sort of shoving perhaps too many eggs uh, into one basket. And let me just close then, uh, since we just have a few minutes here, on the notion of what are the risks. Uh, obviously, this is a very challenging initiative. Folks have, who've looked at this closely have emphasized that if they get anywhere near uh, trying to implement what they say they want to do with the Belt and Road Initiative, it would far trump the Marshall Plan in terms of complexity, you know, their ability to handle this. And does China have the know-how, the experience, uh, the, the sort of ability to carry this off? That's obviously a big concern. I actually think the, the bigger threat, though, is this uh, notion that I described in the opening, which is this idea that this is so politically associated with President Xi, his foreign policy legacy, making the China dream, which is sort of his contribution to the foreign policy canon I mentioned earlier, uh, more relevant and more successful, that it's too big to fail if you will. Uh, and in fact, what we're seeing is a, a lot of emphasis on doing this, even in areas where it may not make a lot of economic sense. Uh, one of the things that we really thought was interesting in the research we did was talking to large state-owned enterprises, large state banks, you know, people in, in those spaces who would be key in implementing this thing. They have real concerns about whether this is being done, you know, for economically viable uh, uh, projects and transactions. And so I really think that that's probably the, the chief risk that President Xi will, will face with the program. So let me stop there and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chris. Um, one of the questions I want to come back to you about, Chris, I've just, it makes me think of two things. One is, 
um, this point about excess industrial capacity, how many young people join the Chinese labor market every year is sort of one question, because I, I, I think that is a domestic driver of this. And I think the other is, and maybe this is a question for Olin, is how much of this, does this rhyme with the recycling of petrodollars in the 1970s in the sense of that there's large amounts of U.S. dollar reserves and how, what they're, how they're using their U.S. dollar reserves. Is this, is this something similar to recycling petrodollars in the 1970s? So those are two things I think maybe perhaps for us to come back to and think about later. So yeah, thank you for being here. You're the Special Representative for Commercial and Business Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Thanks for being here, and uh, we'd love to hear your, your take on One Belt, One Road and what it means for U.S. policy and what is U.S. policy on this. Thank you. Sure. Thanks very much, Dan. I appreciate it. And Chris, to you as well, congratulations. Um, having worked at a think tank, I know the, the feat that it is to produce and get these things out and the hard work that goes into it. So kudos to the both of you for framing, I think, a really interesting discussion. Um, so with that, I mean, just to take a step back from specifically what China is doing, just thinking about the global picture and infrastructure, you've probably seen in, uh, in the report that these gentlemen have produced, there's a reference to the World Economic Forum's uh, analysis that suggests a $3.7 trillion gap in infrastructure investment globally that's needed on an annual basis. Uh, and within that, obviously, Asia's infrastructure needs feature very, very prominently uh, and has been the subject of much discussion, be it as a virtue of the AIB debate last year or some of the things that we're trying to do here from the states, which I'll discuss briefly as well. So uh, the point is, whether it's China or the US or anyone else, we're talking about a sector that has a huge glaring need. Let me then just speak very briefly about three points. One is what are we here in the United States government trying to do about that? Um, obviously in conjunction with and sometimes independently from our companies that are very active in this space. Secondly, what's our view of China's Road and Belt Initiative? And then thirdly, what are the ways in which what China is doing and what we are doing intersect um, uh, and, and can actually be an opportunity for collaboration? So on the US government's uh, role in the infrastructure space, many of you are probably quite familiar with this. It's probably also laid out in the report. But there are a variety of US government uh, agencies, departments that are involved in this space. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Trade and Development Agency, TDA, they do terrific work, for example, in terms of feasibility studies. They just funded one such feasibility study on an LNG uh, receiving terminal in Thailand, which has now turned into a billion dollar project with 22 US companies involved. So that's one kind of very concrete contribution from the government. Uh, on the financing side, Exim, OPIC. OPIC, for example, has been uh, just provided a loan to Apollo Towers in Myanmar, $250 million loan for a $336 million project to build out the telecommunications sector in that country. That's another specific way in which we contribute. The Commerce Department, uh, for those of you who have run through there or that are on the corporate side of things, uh, there's obviously all the advocacy work that they do um, in terms of supporting U.S. companies bidding for foreign tenders, foreign procurement, and so on. Uh, but there's a lot of other work that the Commerce is also involved in and leads the interagency efforts on in, in some of the infrastructure space. So for example, I think part of the thinking within the government, and Commerce is a part of this as well, is uh, how do we actually engage not just on an advocacy one-off basis in a country, but how do we actually develop a country strategy to meet a country's infrastructure needs so that we're not, we're doing this in a more holistic environment. And so the, related to that is the idea of engaging earlier with governments on as they assess their needs versus only at the point of contact when a company is bidding. So commerce obviously is an active role. And I'll just say at the at, uh, last uh, is the State Department centrally involved in all of this in a few different ways. For those, again, those of you in the private sector, you probably see that value add in the field very clearly when you go to our embassies, go to our ambassadors who have what's called chief submission authority. When you're uh, pushing for a contract or you run into a roadblock, uh, the embassy team, which is led by an ambassador from state, uh, but also involves representatives from other departments and agencies, work together to push uh, on behalf of our companies. And I'll just give you an anecdotal example. I was in India last or two weeks ago, and one of the companies uh, that we were engaging with is an infrastructure company that has a project contract lead out in a, a new city that's being built up in India. Run in some issues, we were able to connect the dots with the chief minister's office and help break that logjam, and hopefully they'll get their award letter of award at the end of the year. So I'm spending some time dwelling on the tools that we have to lay some context for an analysis of what we could do better what China is doing and where we intersect. So those are some of the sort of agency department efforts that happen. Now, uh, it's no secret that we're not always necessarily as well coordinated as we could be 
and that's one of the central recommendations of the report, and it's a, it's a point that's very, very well taken. I think one effort to do a better job in that, and it's a big challenge, it requires rewiring the way we've been doing business in, in Washington in a number of areas. One effort to do a better job at that is US ASEAN Connect, which is a new initiative that some of you may be familiar with. This is something that the President announced at the Sunnylands uh, Leaders Summit uh, with all the ASEAN leaders present. And basically what we're trying to do is to set up, uh, for all practical purposes, a one-stop shop in Southeast, Southeast Asia, specifically the U.S. mission to ASEAN, which is in Jakarta, where we would co-locate all these different individual agencies, personnel that I referred to. Uh, state obviously would already be there, but XM, OPEC, TDA, so that if you're a U.S. company that wants to pursue an infrastructure opportunity in ASEAN, you don't have to go to every single individual embassy uh, and ambassador. You don't have to chase down the resources from one and the technical assistance from other. It's much more presented as a package, which frankly is something that a lot of countries, and not just China, but a lot of other countries, just are much more effective at doing. So the idea of U.S. ASEAN Connect is a, is a main hub in Jakarta, with a satellite office in Singapore and Bangkok. There are four pillars to this framework. One is focusing on energy connectivity. The other is on uh, policy and connectivity, and that's an important point, which if we were to kind of draw out some of the distinctions, which we believe is important. Infrastructure and promoting the development of infrastructure is not just about building things, but it's about the policy and regulatory environment and allow that to happen. So that's a priority area of this Connect initiative. So energy, policy, Business uh, Connect, which is helping our companies from an advocacy point of view get the key contracts, and then people to people, which is very important. Part of what we've been trying to do is through programs like YC Lee and so on that you may be familiar with. So the point there is that the recommendations well taken for the need for integration, and in the infrastructure space, we hope that US ASEAN Connect can be uh, a seed that we're trying to plant that will develop into something that's a real meaningful platform for our companies in this space, right? So that's the US government and what we're trying to do. Obviously, there, there's so much that our companies are doing independent of us in many ways, and that's terrific. That is our model in a sense. We don't always maybe do as good a PD job of owning the success of our companies. Uh, our companies are not tools of our foreign policy, but we definitely uh, enable where we can and also see a lot of good work that they're doing independently of the government. And so, you know, be it, for example, I see some of the reps from G here in the room, the work that they're doing in Pakistan or so on, um, or uh, th that is exactly what I like to think of as sort of a much more decentralized way to, to the way we approach infrastructure in particular. Uh, so that's the U.S. government side. Let me just briefly speak to the fact that other than the U.S., our government, our companies, there are a lot of other players in this space. There are all the MDBs, and I'll defer to John to speak about that. Uh, there are individual countries. We have Japan, for example, that set up a $110 billion fund in infrastructure focused. And then we obviously have China's Road and Belt Initiative. And I know it's a great storyline to think of this as sort of purely from the geopolitics dimension. But I think um, what Chris has laid out for you very much echoes with my own analysis, and it's an issue I've spent a lot of time on, talking to Chinese officials and think tanks about, that there is really a, a very vast and diverse mix of motives as a result of which Road and Belt has come out. For example, we talked about the economic dimensions, excess capacity. Uh, some people go so far to even call Ober as a form of domestic stimulus, which I think is an interesting phrase. There is, um, there is the sort of contending regional dimensions of this, that there is the Western parts that have been underdeveloped that are looking to kind of hang their hat on a major initiative to get funds as well. Um, obviously, as I said, the foreign policy part of this gets a lot of attention. So there's a mixture of, of motives of what's driving this. And our fundamental policy has been, and we publicly said this at, at the highest levels, is we welcome, be it AIB or Road and Belt, China's efforts to contribute to this massive gap in infrastructure. And it is indeed massive. But we'll also raise the issue of we hope that that happens in a way that's done with high standards, attention to environment, attention to labor. And, uh, you know, that isn't just a point that we're throwing at the Chinese and then sort of shying away from this. Uh, I can tell you for a fact that when I'm in Beijing, I regularly talk to my Chinese interlocutors about what is Roden Belt, because we have questions about where this thing is headed, how are you going to execute it. You say that AIB, China, XM, Silk Road Fund are going to finance this, but when we talk to member representatives of those institutions, they say, well, Roden Belt is part of what we're doing, but we're going to be market-driven. So even on the financing question, there are gaps that quickly emerge when you start engaging, right? Uh, but at the same time, we've been very much engaging and saying, what are you trying to do? Where do we collaborate? Where do we intersect? Uh, 
We, for example, have a Silk Road initiative that's focused on Central Asia and South Asia. Part of this map runs through uh, that region. What's the intersection over there that we could potentially uh, explore? So the point is, is that um, it is an initiative that could have very, very significant development dividends if done right. We have a lot of questions. Frankly, I think a lot of people in China have a lot of questions about it, which is what Chris was alluding to. And that's why I think at the most recent legislative session, what you saw senior Chinese officials talk about was the need to actually show what this is all about and to move from talking to implementation and to explain these 30 some MOUs that have been signed with other countries on OBOR, what does that practically mean on the ground? So we'll be, we'll be tracking that and continuing to ask those questions of the Chinese. But let me in closing just zoom out to a larger point which is you know, not just where do we intersect with OBOR but where do we intersect with China in the space of infrastructure and development. And over here I think there's a much, uh, it's a very interesting and a very positive storyline that's developing. At the last SNCD, the last strategic and economic dialogue, both governments signed an MOU on global development cooperation. We have some bright spots post Ebola in Africa, Afghanistan, where we actually jointly train Afghan diplomats, kind of an interesting program, and East Timor, a food security project. What more can we be doing together? And the fact that we actually sat down, negotiated an MOU, and did that is very promising, I think, in terms of what we can do together, including an in infrastructure. Relatedly to that, obviously, is our collaboration, not just bilaterally, but through the MDBs. And there I'd refer you to the, the September 2015, uh, this is a very sort of anodyne name, but the China Economic Fact Sheet that came out um, during President Xi's visit. But if you just look at paragraph one of that, that talks about how the US and China are going to approach the idea of strengthening the existing international financial architecture, replenishing uh, their, their lending arms, working together to optimize balance sheets. You know, this is, let's just be honest, this is something that's meant to show that we are not reading off the same script and both our governments want to work together in terms of reinforcing the architecture. A lot of the AIB debate was that US and China are at odds. The fact that we both sat down together and said this is something we want to jointly build up I think is a very promising line as well and it has ramifications for infrastructure as well. I'm sure John will address that in more detail. But I'll just wrap up by saying that, you know, obviously we have a variety of tools in the US government. We're constantly focused on making them work better. The US ASEAN Connect is one effort. We're not the only players. China is doing things that we're tracking, we have questions about, but by no means are we standing outside and throwing stones at this. We're actively discussing this initiative with them to solicit clarity. And there are opportunities within the wider rubric of our relationship, I think, to do more here. So I'll stop there and we can go further in the Q&A. Thank, thanks, Syed. Thank you very much. Um, we were very active here at, at CSIS over the last 18 months on uh, issues around Exim Bank reauthorization as well as IMF quota reform, uh, both topics that I think touch on the issue of AIIB and I think are relate to the issue of, of one belt, one road in, in a number of different ways. But um, I think one of the things that we talked about in the report is to provide um, long -time congre longer term congressional authorizations for critical agencies such as Exim Bank. Uh, and I think the fact that it got reauthorized uh, one, by hook or by crook I think was a good thing, my view. Uh, and also I think that the IMF quarter reform, which is hard to put on a bumper sticker uh, and is hard to describe uh, in less than a page or two pages and why it's important, uh, I think also was important for the broader, the, the global conversation about, about the, uh, and I know we'll hear a little bit more about that from Olin, but I, I want to make three points just reflecting a little bit on what Zayed had to say. One is, um, I do think, and we talk about this in our paper, uh, that we need to reprioritize infrastructure, uh, and I think it's great that some of the, some of the initiatives that Zayed was mentioning the U.S. government is doing, I have very, very high regard for both the CEO of OPEC and the CEO of TDA, I think they're some of the most capable public servants in the Obama administration. We've hosted them here many, many times. We think the world of both of them, they're really great. Um, I do think that the fact that, infra the fact that AIIB got 50 plus uh, country signatories in a very short amount of time speaks to the massive demand for infrastructure that Zia re referred to. I also think there, and we had the former National Security Advisor for Australia who's here as an affiliate or visiting fellow at CSIS and I hosted him for a conversation about development, and I said, well, why did you guys join AIIB? And he said, well, we, want, we wanted China to be a quote unquote a responsible stakeholder in the system. Uh, we're concerned about infrastructure, and we also wanted to make a statement that we weren't, 
we weren't beholden to the United States and not and not doing it. That was literally what he said. Um, and so I said, okay. Uh, so I think on one issue, this issue of infrastructure is not going to go away. There's not we we the United States I think got out of the infrastructure business in the early 70s for a whole number of development reasons, and I think we need to return to it, and I think this is an opportunity for us to think about returning to it. Um, I do think the other point that, that Ziad mentioned is this issue referred to are the issues of standards, things such as human rights, environmental standards, and labor standards, which are an important part of what makes the multilateral system uh, world meet, meet sort of global standards and is attractive in a number of different ways also can be, I think, can slow things down and it shouldn't take five years to get approval for a, uh, an infrastructure project in the multilateral system and I think that is, I think, another reason why I think AIIB has come about. So I do think we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need to keep those standards, but I think we need to do a better job of being more, uh, have, operate with more alacrity in terms of how we review these sorts of things. Um, because I do think the first time there's a, you know, I think there's reasons why Burma or Myanmar wanted to kind of re, 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 reset its relationship with the United States. And I think one of the reasons was is some of its back and forth and difficult uh, relations with, with China on, on, um, on some infrastructure projects. And I think that one of the, the Zambian elections a year or so ago turned on the issue of Chinese investment in the country. So I do think these issues of human rights, environment, and labor, which our challenges for all institutions are going to be challenges for the AIIB and, and how this is rolled out. Um, just find one final point, just reflecting what Zia had to say. I've been in Pakistan and Kazakhstan in the last 18 months on different trips, and they certainly welcome One Belt, One Road, and they welcome the increased investment in infrastructure, but they also welcome increased U.S. engagement. I wouldn't necessarily call it a balance, but I would say it's in, in, at the same time they'd like to have it come at the same time. So I do think the, the things that Zia was mentioning I think are very, very welcome in this context. So, um, Olin, thank you for being here. Um, I think you've, uh, you've been in government, you've been in the private sector, you've also uh, created a very important report on Asian economic architecture, so the floor is yours. Thanks for being here. Well, I'm glad to be here, Dan. I, when you invited me, I thought maybe you'd get 20 people for this uh, topic. Uh, <laughs> it's so far away, in a sense, and uh, on such a nice day. I'm impressed by the uh, robust turnout. Um, I do think this is a very uh, important topic in terms of, um, of U.S. interest. Um, I think the significance of what China is seeking to do in the Belt and Road Initiative is underappreciated in Western uh, policy uh, circles. Um, I think the Chinese motivations for this initiative are quite uh, complex. I think we've, the panel here, uh, my friends have captured uh, most of them. Um, I guess I would elevate to some extent the geopolitical component of this, uh, maybe a bit higher than some of the comments uh, uh, this afternoon. But uh, I think it's difficult to tease out the various strands and to, and to weight them. Um, but I do think this has long-term implications for U.S. position uh, in Asia. I do not think we can take much comfort from the fact that major components of the Belt and Road Initiative may not succeed, that there will be challenges but there will be difficulties, rejection in many countries along the um, uh, overland and maritime uh, route. But I think nonetheless, because of the size, and Chris referenced the personal commitment of Xi Jinping uh, to this initiative, this is at the heart in many ways of the China dream because the geopolitical piece and the economic piece are closely intertwined. The economic component of this is that it is an element of long-term sustainable prosperity within China. And it also addresses solution to some of the regional inequities and underdevelopment uh, that exists within China. I'm sorry. 
But the, the commitment to this is so large that when joined with the priority that I think many uh, countries along the Belt and Road Initiative place on infrastructure, uh, the U.S. needs to elevate in its priorities within its foreign policy agenda uh, this question of, um, of infrastructure because infrastructure is at the top of the political agenda of virtually every country uh, in Southeast Asia uh, and beyond. Uh, we have had over the past several decades, as Dan said, we abandoned a policy of support for infrastructure, at least direct support. We do engage in many ways in which uh, Ziad uh, described. But we've moved in large part out of the direct financing field. I do not think we can or should re-enter that. But I think there are things that we could do to create a much more robust uh, strategy with respect to infrastructure. And one that would begin to stand alongside the emphasis that the U.S. has placed on a rules-based order. We need to continue that. We need a rules-based order, and one even that extends to disciplines uh, in areas that affect infrastructure development. But we also need to adjust, I think, to the realities of mercantilistic uh, diplomacy. And we cannot assume or take comfort in the prospect that this initiative by China will fail. As I said, some aspects of it will be challenging Many specific uh, transactions may fail or prove uh, non-performing or financially unviable. Uh, but as a whole, this is a formidable, a formidable initiative. And the numbers are large. If one were to uh, look uh, most specifically at what China's policy banks are doing, and this will be the main vehicle for their uh, financing initiatives. It will not be the AIB. What the AIB will do will, is small change in comparison to what China's large policy banks are already doing. One can anticipate AIB financing even under the best of circumstances, and these will not be projects they've initiated in large part in the early years but will do in a co-financing arrangement with other MDBs, maybe in the range of two to three billion a year. The major Chinese policy banks already in the last three years, not in terms of what government has pledged, which is a much larger number, that rising into the hundreds of billions of dollars pledged by the Chinese government to other countries on a long-term basis. But if one looks at bank commitments, that is where policy institutions have taken the political pledge and have actually signed agreements, hard commitments for credit and other forms of financial support, that number in the last three years, 2013 through 2015, it's in the range of 135 billion by the best numbers that I have seen. And I would direct your attention to a piece that I expect will come out in the Financial Times in the middle of this week, which will lay some of this information out publicly. Um, but those, those numbers in the context of what existing multilateral institutions are doing. Uh, what MDBs are doing are dwarfed already by what Chinese policy banks have already done the past three years. Total lending of the World Bank Group is in the range, and this is not just infrastructure. Infrastructure is maybe 40% of it. Uh, is in the range of 30 billion. If one looks at the Asian Development Bank total lending in the range of 20 billion last year, maybe half of that for infrastructure. Uh, and the pace at which 
China's policy banks are lending into countries along the Silk Road, that has been increasing with some rapidity over the last several years. If one were to take as a baseline the year 2013, China's lending by policy banks globally was in the range of 65 billion. About 20% of that went to Asian countries <clears throat> along the Belt Road uh, geography. Last year, that 20% of total lending, and total lending increased by about 25% last year. That is actual commitments again, not talking pledges, it's much larger. They pledged, for example, 46 billion to Pakistan. Of that 46 billion in the last two years, what they've actually committed to is in the range of about 8 billion. So I'm talking about bankable commitments. In 2015, those commitments to Asian countries went from 20% in 2013 to 40% of the total in 2015. And in the fourth quarter of 2015, 60% of China's global aggregate financing went to Asian countries along the Silk Road. And those commitments are closely tied into China's uh, SOE uh, industries. Uh, there is a linkage between financing and uh, origin of product and construction expertise. So I think the, the challenge is large. We can expect those numbers, despite the economic slowdown within China, uh, to continue to grow. And they will continue to dwarf what the AIB does and to um, uh, far exceed uh, what collectively is done by every other multilateral lending institution globally. Now, one can say that that doesn't necessarily, that kind of soft power or, or checkbook diplomacy doesn't translate into political uh, influence and positioning and crowding out. And I'm not suggesting that the U.S. needs an initiative uh, in this field as a counter to Chinese strategy. But I do believe that because this is at the top of Asian agenda, we cannot avoid, we have to play on this issue as well. And so the question is, what do we do? Which is a very hard question. Um, and I would suggest that the answer, if there is one, lies in several uh, components. Uh, one of those is I think we have to self-consciously construct and do it in conjunction with our allies, a, a deliberate agenda strategy that addresses the political requirements of Asian uh, countries for infrastructure uh, development. We have a number of levers, I think, underutilized in the multilateral banks. Their history has been checkered, but they are proven institutions in many respects. They've shown the ability to adjust, to adapt to changing circumstances. They have a track record. They have some respect, I think, I'm convinced. And these are institutions uh, that the U.S. and its close allies essentially uh, have the influential hand. We have underplayed the utility, I think, of these institutions. And in terms of capacity, there is within these institutions underutilized capacity. The equity to portfolio uh, ratios of these institutions is far, far higher than it is among commercial banking institutions. Collectively, it is probably in the 40% uh, percent range. And that could be drawn down to 
a level that's much closer, I think, to commercial uh, ratios without endangering triple A rating. So we don't have a we don't have a capacity issue in these institutions. That is, we can match other financial providers through these institutions. Um, and we have bilateral partners, and reference was made earlier to what Prime Minister Abe announced in May of last year, an additional 100 billion US dollars to support infrastructure in Asia, with which we could cooperate uh, much closer. I think we also, not just in the institutions and in allies, but in terms of broad acceptance with many countries on the periphery of the Asian continent, we have countries that value and recognize the established norms that many of these institutions have lived by and have developed over several decades. And the open procurement, open market, good governance, transparency, rule of law dimension is a strength that we have. And I think there is more that we can do by way of senior level diplomacy to make those fundamentals of American policy. And then lastly, I would reference the ability of existing institutions uh, to mobilize private capital. Uh, this is an underutilized uh, instrument of these institutions. And yes, the ability to mobilize private capital is closely linked to the underlying governing investment atmosphere of recipient borrower countries. The two go together. Um, but I think there are new ways, expanded ways, using existing mechanisms that could be undertaken to move, for example, from about, in the case of the Asian Development Bank, about 10% going to private um, uh, investment uh, projects. That number could be moved substantially higher and the, the leadership of the Asian Development Bank wishes to do that. And I think, for example, in conjunction with our allies, uh, we could give support for private sector initiatives uh, a much stronger boost as part of a more comprehensive, a more strategically focused um, infrastructure development initiative. I went too long, but thank you. Olin, I'll that was there. phenomenal. Thank you very, very much. That was the voice of experience. That was just great. Um, what I have said to many American policymakers is, if we don't meet the needs and aspirations of developing countries, they can take their business down the street today and go to China. And that's different than it was 20 years ago. And so we are not a monopoly shareholder in sort of offering solutions, uh, development solutions, if I can put it this way. And so I do think this issue of constructing a deliberate strategy that meets the needs of Asian countries, I think is actually something that's very much needed. I do also think we need to meet dollar for dollar uh, what's being on offer. I think it is very, very possible. Um, we've hosted President Nakao here of uh, the Asian Development Bank, and he is a very impressive leader, has taken a number of steps. He's combined the soft loan window and the regular, the market uh, win windows of lending from the ADB and put them together to allow for, from an accounting basis, to allow for 40% more lending already that was already done. Um, I think he's very committed to reviewing, similar to some of the recommendations we have in our report, uh, about things like reviewing uh, practices, development practices. Um, so I do think there are a number of things you've put on the table here. I think absolutely the United States needs to cooperate in a strategic way with, with the Japanese government. Uh, one of the things that they discuss when they talk about infrastructure is the issue of quality infrastructure. I think is a very interesting way to talk about uh, infrastructure because I think it cap encapsulates a number of different components that, Olin, you were talking about, whether it's rule of law, whether it's standards. I think the other thing we should think about when we think about the hopes and aspirations and needs of developing countries, if you look at polling that the World Economic Forum has done in 100 countries, something like the issue of corruption is a top one, 
two or three issue in, in 100 countries. So if we're not, if we, so to the extent that we are delivering projects that are uh, perceived as cleaner or more transparent, that operate on sort of clear rules of the game, th that actually is an important part of, of one of the things that they offer or should be offering. And I think the institutions have done an improved job in the last 25 years on, on, on these issues of governance and rule of law and, and, and transparency. So I do think these are, these are important points um, that, that I think you've raised. Um, so it, we've come to uh, John Hurley. Thank you, John. Uh, I know you were late because you were working overtime for the American people. For my, as a taxpayer, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. But uh, I know you have a, your, your role at the Treasury Department is you host, uh, you, work on, you work with all the different MDBs, and the reason we wanted a Treasury voice here um, is and you're the, uh, you are the Director for International Debt, De Debt and Development Policy, so that is a very busy job, but basically you oversee and interact with all the different uh, MDBs, whether it's the EBRD, the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, you also deal with the IMF. So uh, you're the point person, or one of the point people for the U.S. Treasury on the issue of, of the multilateral development banks. And, and as Owen referred to, and I think Zia had also referred to, is that part of the U.S. response is not going to be just a bilateral response. It should be a, perhaps a, a, is a multilateral response, or that this is the changing landscape of One Belt, One Road, the emergence of AIIB, I think it requires the United States and partners like Japan and others to think about, well, how, how should institutions that we are big stakeholders in, like the Asian Development Bank or the World Bank, respond to this? I am going to put one, one other, this isn't so much a question for you, John, but I think maybe for the, and more of a rhetorical question, which is how many, how many engineers does USAID, the Asian Development Bank, and the World Bank have today? I'm guessing not, not that many. It's down from, from a long time ago, so I put that as a parenthetical question. Don't, don't answer that. But, um, but John, thank you for being here. and. Um, we, I'd ask you to respond to what you've heard on the panel, but also the and also what you, um, how the U.S. is thinking about this in a multilateral context. Uh, thank you, Dan, <clears throat> and thank you for inviting me to uh, lend Treasury's perspective on this uh, discussion on approaches to global infrastructure development. Uh, I'm not going to be as as targeted on China as some of the others, um, but sort of pull back and give the broader context. <clears throat> and let me start by affirming the Treasury Department's strong support for efforts, domestic, bilateral, and multilateral, to increase in infrastructure investment in Asia and elsewhere. We see this as a fundamental component of our effort to maximize global economic growth in a sustainable manner. I'll offer two pieces of evidence that inform this position. First, uh, IMF studies have shown that a 1% increase in quality infrastructure, you mentioned quality infrastructure, boosts the country's economic output by nearly 0.5% in the short term and 1.5% within four years. Second, emerging and developing countries will need an estimated $1 trillion in infrastructure investment by the year 2020 just to sustain current economic growth. But finding ways to finance necessary investments in infrastructure in developing countries is, is one of the biggest challenges in development today. Public resources make up the majority of infrastructure finance, but underdeveloped capital markets and shallow tax bases make it difficult for domestic resources to keep up with the growing investment demand, resulting in substantial financing gaps. Official development assistance can help, but it's too insufficient to meet this vast need. This means, uh, in our view, we need to focus on local capacity building and the investment climate while developing a pipeline of quality, sustainable projects that deliver positive social and economic returns at the same time. The international development community has been working to address these challenges for several years, focusing on creating the right conditions for investment, expanding the available pools of public and multilateral resources, making better use of data, and enhancing the focus on sustainability. And I'll take these points in turn. First, creating the right conditions. Dan, as your study rightly pointed out, the key constraints is not lack of funding, but a shortage of bankable projects. That is, those that have been planned and prepared to the point where they are ready for investment. This requires building public sector capacity through targeted bilateral and multilateral technical assistance, knowledge exchanges, networking and training programs, as well as strengthening the investment climates and financial markets. These efforts are the nuts and bolts work 
necessary to create enabling environments for investment, including in infra infrastructure. We're supporting this work through multilateral project preparation funds, such as the Asian Development Bank Pacific Project Preparation Facility, which will prepare high quality projects that are not tied to any one specific funding source, but will instead seek funding from a range of sources, governments, multilateral institutions, commercial banks, capital markets, institutional investors, depending on the particulars of the project itself. In Treasury's own infrastructure finance team in our Office of Technical Assistance, which focuses on building government's capacity to accelerate the development and implementation of well-designed and fiscally sound infrastructure projects, whether direct public procurement or public-private partnerships. Among other things, these experts strengthen government's PPP legal frameworks, organizational structures, project analysis and contract preparation, auction and tender strategies. Second, expanding the available pools of financing. While financing may not be the main obstacle to infrastructure development, it is still important, and the multilateral development banks provide critical support for infrastructure in developing countries, as others have said. Infrastructure lending represents roughly 75 percent of the total approvals at the Asian Development Bank and between 25 and 50 percent at the other MDBs. We've encouraged these banks to stretch their existing resources even further through better use of their balance sheets, as Owen was pointing out. And as Dan mentioned, the Asian Development Bank merger of its hard and soft windows will raise annual lending capacity from 12 to 14 billion to 17 to 19 billion over the next decade. And the World Bank's lowering of its equity to loan ratio resulted in a 5 billion in added annual lending capacity. We've also supported creative new initiatives that address the most difficult constraints, such as the Global Infrastructure Facility at the World Bank. The GIF will facilitate collaboration among MDBs, governments, and private investors on infrastructure projects that are too big or too complex for any one institution to manage on its own. And will then seek to catalyze private financing for the deal. In a very difficult budget environment, we are requesting 20 million in our FY17 budget request, which would make us, along with China, the largest contributors to this fund. Mm. Third, making better use of data and knowledge. We are supporting in knowledge sharing and net networking mechanisms such as the G20 Global Infrastructure Hub, which was created under the Australian G20 presidency to be a global platform for countries to exchange information, knowledge, and best practices about infrastructure projects, as well as the World Bank Public-Private Partnership and Infrastructure Resource Center. And fourth, enhancing the focus on sustainability. This is critically important from our perspective. We are promoting high quality standards to ensure infrastructure is sustainable and that the benefits are widely shared, including with the poor and rural populations. Sustainable, in our view, means resilient to the effects of climate change, accompanied by adequate mitig mitigation measures and compensation for people and environment and effects, cost effective, which means build, maintain, not build, rebuild, and life saving. Example of widely shared is our Power Africa initiative, which was mentioned in your report, where 4,100 megawatts worth of transactions brought to financial close through collaboration between governments, donors, and the private sector, and off-grid solutions, which are a big part, with $1 billion committed to small-scale and off-grid projects. This is our basic approach, and I look forward to the discussion, but let me close with a brief point on AIIB. We continue to have conversations with China and other AIB members in the, um, in the import of the importance we attach to AIB complementing the current international financial architecture, and we are seeing positive signals in that regard. We have seen recent reports of AIB co-financing projects with the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank, and this is something that we welcome, uh, strongly welcome. With that, I'll close. Thank you. Thanks. So I think a couple of your points, John, I think are really interesting. The issue of local capacity building, uh, I think both national and subnational government, much of, most of the world today lives in cities, so much of the decision making about infrastructure is not necessarily at, at national capital levels, it's actually at city levels or subnational government levels. And so this issue of capacity building is, is quite in, important and interesting. I was with a number of uh, Philippine cabinet members a couple of years ago, 
and it was they, what their biggest complaint was is below our level or one level below us or below that, it's very hard to get folks who can actually manage some of these projects are not trained to do so, and we need help training these folks. Well, this is not necessarily sexy stuff. This takes a long period of time. Uh, there was a whole area, of field of practice in international development in the 50s and 60s called public administration, which is a concept of governance and capacity building. There's no political constituency for this concept, in, whether in the United States or elsewhere. This is a very hard thing to finance, and it's hard to measure. It's not, it's not particularly attractive, but it, it, I think to John's point, I think it's very important. On the issue of investment climate, which is something John mentioned, We've been very active here at CSIS trying to protect and uh, make sure that the, the doing business indicators and the related investment climate, uh, there was a move to try and kill or dilute the doing business indicators. And part of our job at think tanks is sometimes to stop stupid things from happening. And so we stopped that stupid thing from happening or we had something to do with that and we're, we're particularly pleased with that. Um, but I do think uh, one point I want to leave you with, because I think this is quite important for this group to think about, Okay, it is very important that we have subnational and national capacity building. I think it's been an achievement of the United States and other OECD countries to revise World Bank procurement standards. Now, this seems like a very obscure topic. Now, what the heck is World Bank procurement standards? Well, they are the de facto VHS standard for developing country governments when they go and buy a bridge or they build a road. They use World Bank standards. And just for the last 60 years, World Bank standards has been about lowest bid. Now, there's a lot of reasons why it's been about lowest bid. It's simple. It also helps with anti-corruption issues. And so we've spent a lot of time as the United States and other OECD countries saying, eat your low bid vegetables and eat your work from the World Bank standards. They've, we've just changed those standards to include the concept of life cycle cost. This is this issue of quality infrastructure, so things like taking into account the life of a project, so not necessarily bidding on a low bid basis. That is great news. That's good. So in the context of, as a standard setter, the World Bank has changed its standard. Okay, that's great. And so the World Bank has wa washed its hands a little bit, but uh, my understanding is there are 7 million public officials in the country of India that makes decisions about procurement in India. So maybe that's not 7 million people in India, but maybe it's 500,000 people that are going to have, there's some level of training and capacity building in, in the tens of thousands, probably in the hundreds of thousands or more, that if you want to move from this low bid standard to some more complex life cycle standard in city governments, like I don't, I've never met anyone who is a procurement decision maker in the city of Luanda. I've not met anyone who's a procurement decision maker in the city of Astana, but I think you get the idea that this is going to be long, expensive, and complicated. So I think it's great that the West has changed the standard. So when we talk about capacity building, this is going to be a massive global project. And I think it's going to be very much related to this issue of procurement and the kinds of, if we want to have quality infrastructure, we have to have discerning public officials in developing countries who are capable of discerning what is quality and making decisions other than low bid. So I know it's a little bit of a mouthful, but I think it's quite important and it's an important nuance that we're collectively going to have to look at. I cannot imagine the World Bank footing the bill for training hundreds of thousands of people. I think they're going to look to bilateral donors like AID or JICA or others in the, in the ODA world to do this, and it's going to be in the billions of dollars. So, okay, we've gone on a bit. Ziad, I want to give you a Go ahead, go ahead, Ziad, please. Thank you so much. This is great. Um, there was just one point I wanted to draw out a bit, which comes from what Olin was saying about this conversation not just being about infrastructure narrowly, but about economic strategy writ large and, and your view of... Uh, China's economic strategy in Asia beyond being through OBOR. I just wanted to address that point because we are obviously focusing from the U.S. side on what we're doing in the infrastructure space, but there is a larger, broader economic strategy which we are pursuing within which this effort of connectivity and infrastructure fits. And, you know, I'd, I'll steer you to the remarks the Secretary Kerry gave in Singapore last fall about what is our economic strategy in Asia. And very briefly, he talked about four areas that will not be lost in this audience. The first is trade, obviously, the fact that trade is an essential part of U.S. engagement in Asia, TPP being the flagship initiative that we're pursuing right now. Uh, 
The second is investment. We are obviously getting at it a little bit when we're talking about infrastructure investment. But the fact is the sheer quantity and actually the quality of U.S. investment in Asia and ASEAN including is vast and high. And part of what we're trying to do right now in going across Asia as part of what the Secretary announced uh, as his Innovation Roadshow series is to have senior principals in the State Department take groups of U.S. companies across Asia. We just finished phase one where we went to Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines and four cities in India to your point of sub-national engagement. So it was State Department officials with U.S. companies across a range of areas, infrastructure, clean tech, you name it. And that's about showing the value proposition that U.S. investment brings. And that's a very strategic effort to constantly showcase that through these innovation roadshow series. By the end of the year, we'll probably have covered about 15 key cities across Asia as part of that effort. Third, development. You're all more familiar with that, the development assistance we give programs like the Lower Mekong Initiative. And the fourth pillar that he talked about of our econ strategy in Asia is connectivity. And I use that word deliberately because what was just said earlier was that we need to speak to the needs and in the language of the region. And we picked the word connectivity for U.S. ASEAN Connect because in ASEAN they don't talk about infrastructure needs, they talk about connectivity needs. That's their word which we're using to speak and that's what we built out with U.S. ASEAN Connect as part of our you know, signature initiative. Now, you might start thinking, well, is U.S. ASEAN Connect the response to OBOR? No, it's not. It's meant to be a discrete effort to help our companies do more infrastructure in Asia. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is that when we're having this conversation about what's the U.S. doing in infrastructure in Asia versus this massive totality of a Chinese initiative, I'm trying to put the connectivity piece within the wider frame so you can get a sense of our broader effort. Thanks. I'm just looking at the time, and I just know there's a very knowledgeable uh, audience out there. So I want to call on you've all been very, very patient. So let's try and get three or four. We'll do this World Bank style, so we'll capture three or four questions. So I see uh, two folks over here. Uh, uh, okay. I'm looking. Okay. So I'm going to have th this gentleman here, right uh, here. Uh, this gentleman in the second row, this gentleman, I'm trying to get a little gender balance here. Come on, work with me, people. <laughs> and this woman here in the, in the purple. Thank you. Yeah, Bill Jones from Executive Intelligence Review. Uh, I'd just like to make a comment where this came from. I just note that in 1997, uh, EIR gave out this report called uh, The New Silk Road, uh, a, a Eurasian land bridge, and there were a lot of scholars from China at a conference in 96 that laid out the perspective already then. But with the 97 uh, financial crisis, 2008 crisis, there wasn't the money for it. And President Xi, I think, very, very much personally took that upon himself to push this thing forward. And so I think it's a, a project whose time has come, but it's been around for a little bit. I would like to address uh, Mr. Wethington's comment I, th I thought were very important. I'm glad to hear in the conference that there is a reorientation towards uh, infrastructure investment. The, this is something as time has come, uh, I, and, and we've lacked it incredibly. But I uh, question whether the uh, proposals that, uh, that you put forward will actually work uh, by using the multilateral uh, development banks only. Uh, the, the, United, the world financial system is in a tremendous crisis. There's two quadrillion dollars worth of outstanding debt totally, including derivatives and everything else that's demanding payment. That's why we're in trouble. That's why we don't have money to do these type of things. And unless something is done to restructure the financial system, it probably would include a moratorium. It might include, some people are calling for a uh, jubilee, uh, and also uh, a, a return to the Glass-Steagall principles. We're not going to have the ability to do this kind of thing. And, and I think we can do it in cooperation with China, because I, I detect also a little animosity that, you know, China is doing this and uh, we should be on top here. Whereas with the Chinese, they're always extending the olive branch. And President Xi, I would be surprised if he comes here on the weekend and doesn't again say, the U.S. should be a part of this Silk Road Belt. This is my project. I would like you to work okay. with it. Great, okay. thanks. Though I'd say, obviously, in the context of Myanmar or Zambia, I'd say you know, some of the some of the uh, some of the hand-handedness of China actually has been has, has been an issue. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily all olive branch all the time. This gentleman here in the jacket and the blue shirt. Hu Tao from WWF. Thank you for your excellent presentations. 
we all know China has a strong capacity for infrastructure development. But my observation is China actually is also lack of infrastructure, lack of soft infrastructure, like a legal system, research capacity, even financial management, project management. China's investment in Burma, in Venezuela, that's our examples. But uh, compared with U.S., uh, compared with China, U.S. is opposite. China, U.S. has a strong, soft infrastructure and a soft power. My question is to our panelists, is it possible for U.S. to work together with China on one by one route? By, that would be the good combination, soft infrastructure and hard infrastructure. Thank you very much. Okay, so the chocolate and peanut butter of geo strategy. That's <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. Okay, we'll come back to that. So this gentleman over here, uh, this gentleman over here, and then this woman in, in, the, in purple. Yeah, in the, he's got the flag pin. Alex Milagishuli, IHS, thank you very much for your presentations, very informative. I have a very quick question. Um, late, uh, late last year, uh, Secretary Kerry made the tour of central, five Central Asian countries and announced the C5 plus one initiative. Well, now, in the context of this discussion, um, I have to note that uh, this C5 plus one was devoid of any specific financial commitments in contrast with Shinzo Abe's visit, uh, during which uh, Shinzo Abe actually only to Uzbekistan pledged uh, uh, more than uh, a dozen billion dollars. So uh, my question to you is this, as you pass this on to the next administration, would it be possible to hope that U.S. will increase financial commitment when it comes to major infrastructure development projects in Central Asia, which, it, which are very much needed. Thank you. This woman here. Hello. Um, I'm Mary Iris with the Congressional Research Service. And as we uh, continue to, to follow this extremely complex and huge initiative, uh, one thing that didn't really come to light today, but one thing we certainly do wonder about is the extent to which some of these projects are commercial <laughs> opportunities, or is this simply a matter of aid, tide aid? Um, and then it gets to the question of how this should, in fact, as Mr. Wethington mentioned, link up with uh, norms, uh, governance, uh, and so how does this all come together? It seems that from a U.S. perspective, if we're looking at the commercial role and the private sector opportunities, uh, United States excels in many infrastructure-driven uh, um, um, projects. So just wondering, from a trade and economic perspective, uh, this is a huge pro huge initiative, and so there certainly does seem opportunity for collaboration going forward, but how does it relate to, again, the rules? You mentioned procurement. I've heard the bank has actually moved towards a country system approach where it's the countries that use their own procurement rules uh, dictate how projects are, are, are bid and, and won. So are we getting back to best practices in procurement and are countries going to, are we going to devote more energy to that? So again, just looking at sort of the commercial and the private sector role in all of this seems to be significant, potentially. Thank you very much. So any comments on that? Thank you. Well. Okay, Chris, why don't we just start with you and we'll go down. All right, there we go. Uh, on the issue of working together, uh, you know, I think we've heard from our U.S. government colleagues uh, that the U.S. system certainly is open to, to this concept. I actually think uh, we need to adopt a more targeted approach to that, though, instead of just saying we're open to it. I think we should actually test President Xi's sort of statements about this that it is indeed open, um, especially when it comes to the involvement of U.S. and other foreign companies. It's not all about the United States. I mean, whether those be, I think Japanese companies actually are very interesting in that context with regard to how China might handle those sort of, those sort of opportunities. So uh, I, I like your 
formulation of the soft uh, infrastructure and the hard, if you will. Um, and I do think there's tremendous uh, potential uh, to collaborate on this, but uh, I think it, those, those commitments need to be tested. Um, on the issue of commercial and rules, I mean, I think that kind of ran through our whole, <laughs> our whole series of presentations, but you hit on the fundamental issue, because I think, you know, this really is the potential soft underbelly of Belt and Road, is worries by the people who actually have to execute on this that it's more political than commercial. So, you know, we may have these concerns from the geostrategic context that Olin talked to, but I think the Chinese who are involved in, in actually executing it have these same concerns, and that's, uh, that's very important. Um, on the issue of rules, I mean, I think the sense that we're seeing, not on this specific issue, but on some other issues, uh, IMF quota reform, for example, the way the Chinese seem to be approaching it is, we go with the system as it's currently construed until you make it virtually impossible for our sort of voice to be heard. And when that happens, as in that case where it's been sitting in the Senate for God knows how long, uh, we will create parallel institutions that make sense to us. We're a global player with global interests. Well, thank you for the questions. Um, the software versus hardware framework is one that is often raised. And I say that because having participated in, in innumerable think tank events um, with Chinese think tank official, think tankers and others, they raise that formulation a lot, and there's a lot of merit to it. Taking that a step further, then how do you act on it, to Chris's point? Are we just rhetorically saying we're open to this or have we tested it? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I agree with the word test, but I would definitely say that we have engaged with the Chinese government on this initiative in the sense where we've said, what are some specific things we might try to do together? So this isn't just the kind of uh, for public consumption saying we're you know, running away from this and we're saying that we welcome it. We've actually engaged. I, I will also say that the response has been mixed. I, I think part of that is the lack of clarity within the Chinese system of what this is all about. And, and I think that includes some of the state policy banks that can give very conflicting responses to whether or not they are going to be financing road belt projects or other projects. So my, my larger point is we are not just rhetorically approaching this to something welcome, but we are talking to the Chinese. The responses have not always been very clear, uh, but clearly there are certain areas where you know, we can bring a comparative advantage on the soft side. But I, at the same time, I don't want to diminish the fact that there are many U.S. companies that can do a great deal in the hard infrastructure side as well, which goes to uh, the point, sorry, from your question from CRS. Um, it, it's interesting you mentioned the commercial opportunities embedded in Ober. I heard the question slightly differently from Chris. I was thinking about it. Maybe this is my current role. I was thinking about it in terms of U.S. companies and the commercial opportunity for them, which is a very interesting and complicated question. I, I guess I'd point to uh, a publication that AmCham China just came out with that featured that very question and ask the question, what, what does this mean for U.S. companies? And this is the private sector making its judgment. And so I'd recommend taking a look at that uh, and drawing your own conclusions. It's a great report. I second that. <laughs> well, I think, it's, I think for us it's not a, it's not a money issue. Uh, I, mean, I, I think a more robust long-term infrastructure uh, strategy by the U.S. does not require uh, significant new congressional appropriation. Um, I think there are adequate uh, resources within existing MDBs, and I think, uh, as we referenced earlier, other governments are prepared to uh, provide additional uh, resources uh, to a, uh, a combined effort. Um, I, think, I think collaboration uh, needs to be a central part of a, US, a, a new U.S. investment, uh, I mean, infrastructure uh, strategy, uh, and with that in inclusiveness, uh, I think our, our strength lies in our ability to uh, advocate with credibility uh, rules-based uh, uh, systems, uh, governance, uh, transparency, open procurement, uh, common norms with respect to um, uh, 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 financing. Uh, we have a, uh, an OECD export credit arrangement uh, uh, that uh, uh, most everyone uh, is out of compliance with. Uh, if one looks, for example, at the uh, recent uh, uh, procurement uh, process that uh, Indonesia did for its uh, high-speed rail uh, from Jakarta to Bandung, uh, China uh, uh, prevailed over the Japanese bid. Uh, 
uh, I'm told in large part because the, uh, the Chinese did not require uh, any forms of guarantee uh, from the Indonesian government and were prepared to do major portions of that project at zero interest, highly concessional terms. Uh, there is no discipline uh, in this area. Uh, we may get discipline on uh, MDBs. We may get discipline, as I think we probably will, uh, on the uh, AIB. Uh, but if the Chinese uh, uh, policy banks remain outside of the orbit of, uh, of consensus as to discipline on international finance uh, for global projects, uh, the playing field will be, uh, will be skewed in that direction. So let me just touch briefly, picking up on what Olin was just talking about and uh, some of the questions having to do with norms and, and rules-based approach. And as he said in AIB, and as I said before, we're seeing positive signals. Um, and I think that this is partly a reflection of, of President Jin's interest in having a sort of a more rules-based approach. Um, and indicative of that, he, some of the major consultants were previous World Bank employees who were very familiar with the multilateral approach, and I see, think you're seeing evidence of that. Some of the um, uh, policies on uh, accountability uh, have yet to be uh, established, and those are things that we're still looking at because those are things that we think are very important components of, of a multilateral institution. One other thing that um, has not been mentioned is that you know, as China becomes an emerging power and it's a big emerging creditor, uh, as, as everybody knows. And uh, so we have the Paris Club, which deals with um, uh, countries in debt distress and where there's a need to restructure uh, um, certain uh, debts and provide debt treatment. We are engaged in discussions with, with China about becoming a, a member of the Paris Club uh, along with some other emerging uh, creditors. So that's we think that's a, a important uh, in terms of the international financial architecture and particularly as China grows as a, as a creditor to the world. Okay. Yeah, Owen? I had a point on the uh, Chinese policy banks since I, I went after them a bit. Um, uh, these are not uh, uh, independent uh, actors. Um, there's a kind of uh, schizophrenia ambivalence uh, within and among uh, Chinese, uh, China's uh, policy banks. Uh, many of them are concerned about uh, uh, political pressures that skew their lending away from financial uh, viability. Uh, they're concerned about accumulating large numbers of uh, non-performing uh, loans. And um, I think as Chris, uh, as Chris emphasized, uh, uh, they are to uh, some extent a, a restraining influence uh, on uh, uh, the excessive uh, uh, consideration of geopolitical factors uh, in this uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Oh, no, I was just actually going to ask one of our two USG counterparts to address the issue on Central Asia. I don't think we touched on that question. Uh, I don't have a lot to add on that. Um, I think the question was whether or not we expect the next administration to potentially announce greater financing commitments. Is that it? Uh, it's hard for me to, to make that prediction right now. But, I mean, we're going to be having another round of those meetings over the summer, and there'll be th some related items in motion for that. Well, look, uh, thank you all for being with us, and please join me in thanking the panel.